All right, so now officially, welcome to the Food Waste Awareness Webinar that SGM is hosting for everyone today. Um, it was the Awareness Day yesterday, um, but a lot of content was spread yesterday, but we believe that food waste and the awareness around this tremendous problem, but tremendous opportunity at the same time should be addressed every day, actually. Um, so those that don't know me, I'm, I'm Nikki, I'm from the Social Gastronomy Movement, and um, I had the honor <laughs> to um, host this session today together that we created with our team, with Paola Vanessa and the entire team, as well as our wonderful speakers today that will share a little bit of their work that they do on the grounds to tackle this important issue. So I'm delighted to make a quick introduction of everyone that's going to be with us today. And we have calling in Sherry from Agerea, but quite late for her, but she looks beautiful as usual. So <laughs> I'll need your secrets afterward. Um, I want to welcome Elijah, that's calling in from Ghana, from Food for All, um, Food for All Africa. And we are with technical problems with Eva still uh, from Meet My Mama from France. But as soon as she's there, um, Maya will give us a little heads up so that we can make an introduction to her as well. So that being said, I will give a quick introduction on the context of what we're speaking today about food waste. Again, tremendous problem and tremendous opportunity at the same time. Then we're going to go a little bit into the experience of each of the um, community members that's going to share about their experience as well as their work and the solutions that they bring to the table. And then followed by a few questions at the end, there will be a space for Q&A. So whoever is open to, to ask questions is intrigued you can go ahead so, but at the same time, you can continue afterward the conversation through Slack or through different channels um, of social gastronomy movement. We'd love to hear your, uh, your, your opinions as well, recipes maybe you have already, you know, experimented, or as well other people that are doing amazing work that we'd love to learn about and include in our work. So I'm gonna go a little bit to the context setting today. Nikki, before you start, I just want to let yeah. everyone know that um, if that's okay, we're going to be recording because afterwards we're going to upload it to our YouTube channel um, because it's going to be accessible on social media and in our channel. So just for you to know that we're going to be recording. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Paula. As often as she will tell me, I will always forget, but that's why we have a scene. <laughs> So, there we go. This is actually um, Social Gastronomy Movement. We're um, a community, global community and network of interconnected communities around the world. And we're really bringing action on a local level and connecting on a global level. And um, I will not bore you with too much information, but probably most that you are already um, involved today and listening in. Um, you've explored a little bit about social gastronomy advice. Please join us on our, our networks on um, www.socialgastronomy.org and you can find out a bit more. But I want to focus really on the issue today. And this is actually our third co-created webinar. Um, the community holds all the knowledge that we have and we're just giving a voice to this knowledge and being heard um, throughout the network. And so this one is co again co-created with community members that throughout the map that you'll see in a moment um, that are doing amazing work on the ground. So again, really honored to have Sherry, hopefully ever soon, <laughs> and Elijah with us today. So on the next, Vanessa? Yeah. <laughs> again, food waste is um, something that concerns us all. And if you look at some shocking numbers um, that I'd like to bring now is, for example, very tangible that an area larger than whole of China is actually being used to grow the food that never gets eaten. And Vanessa? 25% <laughs> of the world's freshwater supply is actually used to grow the food that never gets eaten. And now from a climate perspective, and reducing food waste is the number one solutions to fight the climate crisis. Imagine countries, I think everyone can think of countries. If food waste were a country, it would be the third largest in terms of emissions after China and the United States. So this is a problem we all have a solution to, and yet we're creating this third largest emissions country in the world. And as a fact, actually, in most developed countries, over half of all the food gets, um, paste, uh, gets wasted in our own homes. And I think this is really shocking because we're all contributing to this problem. And we'll hear a little bit about that afterwards as well. 
And I think the last number I wanted to bring is that we're talking about hunger, which is so relevant in all our communities right now. Hunger is on a rise. And yet we're producing enough food to feed the entire world. So this is something that, that's just shocking because we have a solution at hand. So now we can actually go a little bit into the experience of um, our speakers that we have today to explore what has shocked you. Because when I joined La Fettoria Gastromotiva, I was personally shocked and ever since changed all of my behaviors when I saw the food that actually arrived that was being thrown away and it was so perfect for consumption. And I think after seeing that, I can never go back. So I'd love to know, Sherry, please tell us what has shocked you with the work that you do on the grounds? Thank you very much, Niki, and thank you very much in the social gastronomy movement. I'm like so young uh, uh, as a member of the SGM, but I'm enjoying the community and this opportunity to share our work. Um, so far, what shocked me, I'm in agriculture for 22 years. I started teaching farmers at the age of 12, and every day I'm still shocked on what's happening in the food systems, not only in my country, not only in my backyard, but actually all over the world. Uh, coming from the Philippines, right, we have 110 million people and every day we have 95 children dying because of malnutrition. And we are also a rice-eating country. It's not a meal without rice in the Philippines, but we are importing 21% of our rice, but we are also wasting around 39 million uh, tons of rice annually. So when we were discussing about that, there's so much disparity about smallholder rice farmers are the poorest farmers in the country. They're, on, they're only earning 120, uh, at, you know, uh, around $400 every year from the rice farming. And with a, with a wastage of rice of 39 million tons, it can actually feed around 13.7 million malnourished uh, children. You know, so imagine that entire disparity and the irony of things, why children, at 95 children are dying on a daily basis. And here we are wasting 39 million tons of, of rice on, a, on annually that can save this 13.7 million children actually from dying. So every day it's a struggle and uh, and on the vegetable sector, which I work a lot in, in for the last 10 years in my company, 35% uh, of the post-harvest uh, of the farmers are actually just wasted. The 35% of food waste uh, from the farmers can actually give them additional income of, of around 30%, which means they can have food on their table. I'm always saying that why is it that the producers of the food in the food chain, the farmers and the fishermen are the poorest and the hungriest? It's such a crime against humanity. And here we are, after the farmers putting so much uh, effort and time in producing vegetables, after three months, you know, one third of the vegetables are just going to waste and nothing, right? And, and we have around 4.5 million farmers who are actually dying in hunger experiencing malnutrition, their children cannot go to school because they lack income. So these are the shocking you know, figures and the shocking scenario happening in my daily struggle in the agriculture sector. And the third one actually that I want to share is during this pandemic, the 31% food waste in the, uh, in the vegetable sector actually increased to 75% in the last six months. And, you know, imagine the, the, the increase from 35 to 75%. That's 40% increase in just the last six months. And during this pandemic, you know, my company and my nonprofit, Agraya, has been delivering a lot of foods to at-risk communities. Uh, I remember for the last five months, we've been bringing foods to families who are living inside the cemetery. I'm talking about people who have income below $1 a day. These are, you know, ambulant vendors. And every day, um, we, we give them fresh foods. And every week, we give them, you know, uh, vegetables and rice so that they can sustain their livelihood. And it's so sad um, that every time we go there, we couldn't enter the cemetery to give food to these 300 people. So we need to climb the wall of the cemetery 
you know, to give them food. And it's such irony because these people are, you know, struggling to have food and how to have food on their table. And during this pandemic, the farmers are, have nowhere to bring their produce on the fields. I saw Nikki around two months during the lockdown in the Philippines from March to April. Around two million metric tons of vegetables are just rotting on farmers' fields. And it's so shocking. And it's affecting more than 20,000 farmers. And here we are in Metro Manila with 13 million people stuck looking where to get food. So imagine the tremendous amount of food waste. So one time I went to the cemetery where we go, you know, bring the food. I saw a very, very big placard outside. We are not dying of COVID-19 pandemic. We are dying of hunger and we are dying of malnutrition. And that's the biggest problem. And because of that, it, 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 it actually contributed to a severe social problem. The prevalence of hunger and malnutrition increases domestic violence at home. Because when people are hungry, fight starts. And now, you know, our national defense have been problematic because it actually also increases crime. So what I'm saying this a scenario, it's because the power of food is a nexus of everything. It's the nexus of environment, the nexus for people, the nexus for politics, the nexus for our economy, Salina. but the nexus for peace and security at the same time. Thank you so much, Sherry. Uh, we'll get back to some of those shocking numbers. And I think what most struck me is a crime against humanity. And we are all part of it because it's part of our system that we're creating. And so um, I think that term will stay with me at least tonight. So thank you, Sherry, for, for sharing a little bit. But again, we're going to come back a bit more about your work in a moment. Um, before I go to Elijah, I just want to acknowledge when our um, first speaker today, Eva, has arrived. <laughs> so welcome, Eva, as well, to the group Hello, calling sir. in from France. This one. But really, there is a... I think we all have a lot of empathy uh, when it comes to technical problems and not being able to dial in or whatever. So <laughs> I'm glad you could make it. Elijah, coming back, to, coming to you, actually, some of in our preparation co-creation moment for the um, webinar, I was shocked with some things you gave me. So can you just share with, um, with, with who's attending today a little bit, what has shocked you with the work you do? Like what's really, you know, like going, okay, now I really need to act. So if you could share a little bit, just like Sherry did, and then we pass to Eva, and then we go deeper into um, each of your works after. All right, thank you very much for the opportunity and good evening to everyone. So for me as a chef and then a social entrepreneur working with West Africa's uh, first and largest uh, food bank in Ghana, what really shocked me the most uh, when it comes to food loss and food waste is the rate at which as a country like Ghana, which is a developing country, as we develop as a developing country, we picking up the culture of uh, importing more food uh, uh, process manufacturing and as well uh, processing more food and this way of life now is making us to create more avenue for food to go lost within the distribution and then the consumption stage of the food supply chain. FAO and many uh, development partners in the past have uh, carried out researches and said that when it comes to food going waste, it's in developing countries like Africa, it's usually within the, on the farms. But uh, being on the ground and for the past seven years, being involved in the work of recovering excess food along the supply chain to feed those who don't have, I can boldly say that Ghana and most sub-Saharan countries are actually moving towards food going waste within their distribution and at the household uh, stage. And for me, that's one key thing I believe we should start working on and we are working on from Food for Africa. 
Thank you, Elijah. And I think this is exactly for someone that I've um, not experienced food waste in Africa, like Elijah does every day. So for us, when you learn about food waste and trying to find information, it's exactly that fake news, as some would say, that it's only at the farms but it is in the households. And I think coming back to the numbers I shared at the beginning, that um, we always say in the developing world, it's where food gets wasted in the household, but it is a global thing. It gets wasted everywhere. So Elijah, thank you for giving us um, that insight into as well reality a little bit. So that's why I really wanted you to share that with everyone as well. Eva, I'll go straight to France. <laughs> Please, if you could share a little bit as well, what has shocked you in your work um, with Meet My Mama and personally in terms of food waste and motivates you every day more to do what you're doing? Yeah, so uh, for me, I I've had a restaurant for years and uh, we had sandwiches, gourmet things, juices and things. And so we had a lot of food waste just going to the trash after one day. So we had also changes in the menu and things like this. So we had a whole stock of food downstairs that we couldn't use because it wasn't on the menu. So we decided as instead of throwing this away uh, or just not using it, then we decided to have a salad bar. So we took all this food, we added some fresh vegetables, we made some sauces, we, we invented a whole new thing and we started selling it. And it was such a huge, um, huge success in Paris. Uh, people were coming from all over. We had lines outside the restaurant coming just for the salad bar because it changed every day. We were using seasonal products, anything that we could get basically to to do this. So it was it was really huge for me to see kind of food that would otherwise go to waste kind of be reused in a different way. And uh, but more, I saw it also in my home. Uh, as a chef, I love going shopping. It's one of my love, like my time in the grocery store. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna get that. I'm gonna get this, and I'm gonna get. That. And even me, I can't really control myself. Sometimes I buy way too much food, and I don't plan my meals. And so when I saw I was going over my food cost one month, and I was like, oh, that is very very high. I should probably do something about that. Um, I started taking what I basically do at the restaurant is going over everything I have in my cupboards before I go shopping and planning my meals out and planning my week uh, and only also not going as many times not going for small shops here and stuff just do one big shop once a week I actually reduced the cost of my food bill by about 20 percent at home and I have a rule I have to finish everything out of the refrigerator specifically everything that's fresh before I go shopping again so we have lots of fun meals with like kind of like a potluck thing and the kids love it and I get them also kind of involved in, in, in cooking with me. Um, it's very important to just stay on top of it because um, even now with COVID when we were uh, here in Paris nobody could move nobody could really go to the grocery store I actually opened up my cupboards and realized that I had so much food in there I didn't actually need to go to the grocery store for for one week I was just cooking everything that was in my cupboards and I had so much fun because there was lots of products that I had bought and forgotten about or my husband had bought and not cooked and I think we just have to kind of look into our cupboards like put ourselves really just kind of have rules basically and make sure to plan everything because it is very very important not to waste what we have um, here in France, I think people are also very, um, they love growing things and there isn't actually a lot of wastage for, for older generations. I see that my husband's grandmother, for example, she's taught me so, so much. Uh, she cans everything she grows in her garden. Um, she, all the fruits she gets from her neighbors, she makes all kinds of fruit jellies and, and she makes pâtés or her husband goes hunting. You know, it's really that old uh, those old values that we used to have that we just don't really have anymore because it's so easy to go to the grocery store that we don't really think about it uh, or we don't want to do it but it can actually be quite fun um, and I know here in France they've actually started TV shows about this uh, we have a huge market one of the biggest markets in uh, Europe I think is called Rangis and this is where all the food kind of comes in um, all the fish all the meat and everything and all the food suppliers to the restaurants they shop there in the morning and then they deliver everything to the restaurants um, there are now restaurants that are taking all the scraps all the stuff that that those companies are throwing away after the day they are taking them for free and they'll cook 
anything that they can from these products and they will sell them. So they keep moving into places in Paris and using the food that would normally have gone to waste and feeding people just absolutely beautiful meals I've been and it's just it's a wonderful wonderful thing that they're doing so people are really trying hard but it's it's important to be uh, very focused on it I guess and plan thank you Eva and we're obviously she being a good chef already went into practical solutions as well how she approaches this every day um, and I think one thing that stuck to me I'm, I'm originally Polish and I always said it that um, we learned how to pickle, how to dry, because we only had one season in a way to harvest. So we had to collect it and then live on it all year. And so how did we lose all of this, you know, knowledge, how to preserve our food that, you know, Earth gave us. So I can really, really relate to that. And I'm trying to recuperate the recipes. One day I'll post them. I'll make sure you get them. <laughs> um, so talking already about a bit of solutions, I want to dig a little bit deeper since all three of you are working with this every day. So Sherry, let me come back to you a little bit. Something that again shocked me um is the going from 35 percent to 75 percent in in loss on a farmers uh, on the farms in in the philippines so please elaborate a little bit on that if you could and what are you doing to find solutions to this issue and how can we find long-term solutions yeah i i think the increase of the food waste in the post-harvest loss of the farmers is actually because they lost their market during the pandemic and uh, when the president announced lockdown, total lockdown of Metro Manila, it's actually in the peak uh, season for harvest, you know, going summer. Uh, summer, we have, you know, we have 7,107 islands in the Philippines. So we are where the people go for beautiful white sand beaches. So, you know, from March, we harvest and now there's a lockdown. So all restaurants and hotels are closed. The farmers are planning their, their produce for that and know where to go. So, of course, there's a tremendous increase in the, the food loss, uh, but it's not the consumers who will actually shoulder it. Definitely, it's the farmers who will shoulder it. Imagine they dedicated their lives for three months to ten months to, to grow their foods and go to nothing. So what we did in the company, um, one time, there's like one pineapple farmer who asked me, uh, Cherry, can you please help us to sell our pineapple? And this is like three days after the lockdown. And you know how strict the lockdown in the Philippines. Until now, we're still on lockdown. Every corner of the street has military and police. And if you will not follow the rule, you go to prison straight. And, you know, it's not easy. So I said yes to this farmer to help him. And I said, why, uh, where did you get my number? I said, oh, I, you spoke in uh, one of the farmers event before and I got your number. And I think your organization can help us because I borrowed money from the bank. And now I have 15,000 pineapples to sell. And the income for this pineapple harvest is actually a payment for the bank and the payment for my daughter's graduation in college. The first daughter to graduate and have a university degree. And I was like, oh my goodness, my conscience, if I just close my eyes and enjoy the lockdown and read my books and Netflix and chill, I'll be irrelevant, I guess. So I said, sure, I'll help you. But I did not know what I entered. So I launched the Move Food Initiative of Agrea. And from this one pineapple farmer, you know, he brought his pineapple to Makati, where I live in the Central Business District. And we need to borrow trucks from, you know, politicians in the local so that it can go through the, the security checks. From his farm to my place, it takes 24 checkpoints to get in. And it's not easy. It took him, the, the normal is like 1.5 hours. It took him six hours because of the checkpoint. He arrived here, it's just him, the driver and me carrying 2,500 pineapples. I guess Nikki, I grew muscles carrying pineapples. And then I posted it in social media. And you know what? In just one day, we sold 4,000 pineapples. So it means the farmer needs to deliver 1,500 pineapples just to cover the, 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 the lacking of the orders of people. There's just like so much you know, uh, kindness overflowing from my friends and families who are supporting. So from this one pineapple farmer, now we help 20,900 farmers in the country. What we did, okay, we're talking about solutions, right? I always believe that if there's a way, there's a will. 
And if there's a will, you can create a movement. And you can move things, you can move hearts, you can move people, despite uh, the pandemic that it seems we're doing it, that our hands are actually tied in a chair. So knowing that Philippines is 7,107 islands, it's not easy to, 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 to bring goods. You need to talk to the owners of a boat company, you know, we call it Roro, roll on, roll off, uh, island to island. You need to talk to airline companies. So basically, I did all of that. <laughs> I need to call the owners of a boat company to ship goods from Mindanao because Philippines is Luzon, Visayas, Mindanao. Mindanao is the war zone area of the Philippines, but it's also our food basket. So I need to talk to the owner of the boat for the shipment to help farmers there. And most of these farmers are actually Muslim farmers who have been trying their best to grow because they want to end war in their area. They want to have food and they want to have security because of that farming thing. So we, we've been shipping and after that, we need to talk to the owner of, you know, airline company for cargo. And we've been doing that. So I said, these were the things that I never thought I could do. And most of all, because of all these checkpoints, uh, just saving all this produce of the farmers from all over the country. And I, I couldn't imagine myself doing this, but I, I've been talking and calling in the middle of the night generals to help us with the military checkpoints. To, to call the Ministry of uh, the Department of Agriculture Secretary to give us food passes so that our truck can go through the checkpoints. And there are so many problems along the way. You know, the trucks would collapse at 4 a.m. We couldn't meet the deadline on the shipping because the boat needs to leave the port at 10 a.m. Or we miss the flight because our shipment are stuck in the middle of the road, nowhere to find because of the rain. But you know what? These are so beautiful stories to tell, but the struggles are so difficult. So moving forward right now, I'm so happy. We actually saved 183, almost 200 metric tons of fruits and vegetables as of the moment. And we did not end that, Nikki. We launched the Agria Rescue Kitchen because every time there are shipments from the farmers, some of the farmers, they don't have time to sort it out. You know, so we buy everything from the farmers as the mo at the most ethical price, following the farm gate price, and you receive a lot of ugly fruits and vegetables. And you know, some we donate to 10 community kitchens that supply food to hospitals. So in the last six months, we've been feeding more than 4,500 doctors, nurses, you know, people are frontliners, free food from our, from our mobilization. And with Agria Rescue Kitchen, what we did, we give second chances to ugly fruits and vegetables. Because these ugly fruits and vegetables, consumers will not buy it. You know, they need value for their money. And I cannot just like, oh, okay, these are, you know, ugly fruits and vegetables and no purpose at all. So we, with the Agria Rescue Kitchen, right now we have more than 30 products. We do jumps when strawberry farmers are looking for buyers with their strawberry. We made mango jams when mangoes in the Philippines, it's the sweetest mango, by the way, in the whole world, by Guinness Book of World Record. We're like rapping and going out from our ears because it's overflowing. So right now, we have an array of more than 30 products, value addition from ugly fruits and vegetables. So what we did, solutions, I think, you know, working on our wheel, connections that this produce can be shipped, the farmers can earn income, we have food on the tables, fresh food to all people who are actually don't have access to food because they're stuck at home. And we made sure we are 30 to 40% cheaper than supermarket prices. And third one, with the Agria Rescue Kitchen, we rescued a lot of ugly fruits and vegetables, totaling more than 56 uh, tons of ugly fruits and vegetables. We actually converted them into high value products that actually gave more income. We collaborated with chefs who lost their jobs or closed their restaurants because of the pandemic to create this uh, high value products. And right now we have a lot of people supporting the cause. Yeah, so, so far those are the solutions that uh, we have been doing for the last six months and we will continue for sure. Sherry, did I mention that I want to be Sherry when I grow up? <laughs> <laughs> 
I want to be Nikki also when I grow up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so <laughs> much. <laughs> As long as we're united, we're good. We know the wheel will keep spinning for this movement to happen. So thank you so much. This is um, beautiful. And, and I, I, I will encourage everyone right now. There is a beautiful podcast that our team and Maya did with Sherry. Um, and as well, other fu um, collective fund recipients, the Food Solidarity Fund. Uh, and Sherry's is already on, on the YouTube channel for Social Gastronomy. Pau or Vanessa will post the link below. <laughs> and uh, you will find out many more stories. Because <laughs> I think we could sit a whole bonfire night with Sherry and just listen to the stories. But Sherry is not the only one that has stories. So Elijah, let's go to um, Africa. And please tell us a little bit more about the concrete solutions as a chef. Sherry mentioned chefs, and there is an important role for chefs, so I'm really glad we have two of them right now on this um, group of speakers. Um, Elijah, please share a little bit about the solutions you bring every day to feed those in need with the beautiful initiatives you have. I think you're unmuted. You should be able to speak. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Uh, Nikki, can you come again? I, uh, I if you could share a bit about, no worries, if you can share a bit about um, the stories from your work and the solutions that you and your team bring every day for Food for, um, for All Africa programs. All right. Thank you very much once again. Yes, so for me, uh, food for all when it comes to food waste as well as uh, uh, connecting excess food within the food supply chain it came to me as uh, a surprise or a, a, as an accident uh, so as a young chef uh, working with uh, one of the biggest hotel in Accra I came into contact with a mentally challenged man uh, who pick leftover foods from the trash bin. When we throw the food away into our trash bin at the end of working days, he picks it up and then puts them into small bags, shares it to other mentally challenged people on the streets. And one day uh, I happened to ask him why he does that. And he was like, if he doesn't do it, who will? And that statement struck me so much to the core that it made me start wondering how much of food is being thrown away along the food supply chain. And having come from a family where I lost my parents at a very early age, at age 10, I lost my parents and had to stay with my grandma. And it was true that, that I grew up the passion to become a chef, actually. And I knew what it meant growing up as an orphan, what it meant to go to bed angry. So I thought, what could I do? And gradually, I started uh, with other chefs from other hotels and restaurants in Accra. We were connecting uh, food to orphanages, mental hospitals, food that usually after buffet we have at our restaurant and then hotels then the interest kept growing and i started asking myself is it only within the hospitality sector that will waste food i got to uh, suppliers and also realized they were also having the issue of uh, food waste as suppliers so in 2015 uh, i had to uh, let go of my job and then start Food for Africa. For me, it was quite challenging because when you start talking about the issue of food waste and you start talking about food recovery in Ghana, it sounded very strange to most stakeholders. It sounded very strange to uh, politicians. Most often they thought, ah, there, there's no way food is going to go waste. So we, I had to go the extra mile of going to the ground, uh, letting people know the real story, letting people know what really is happening. And it was quite challenging. However, for me, the fulfilling part was being able at the end of the day 
to provide food to that vulnerable person out there. And what struck me the most at a point was having to be on outreach and then people walk up to you, support you and say that I used to be on the street and I benefited from a food you gave me in the past and I'm grateful for it. So that kept opening us up. We tried because food recovery was quite new in sub-Saharan Africa. We tried to get our government to bring in place at least some kind of policy that guides food donation. It was quite challenging. Uh, we lobbied from people in power. We've not been able to get the policy, but uh, Food for All have been able to open the highs and then the, uh, uh, bring to the fore the importance of food banking in reducing food waste and then anger in, in Ghana. When the lockdown, when the COVID uh, pandemic spread to sub-Saharan Africa, Ghana was one of the first countries that had a case. And we had a case as a result of our president and his entourage actually visiting a country with a case. When they came back, one of the entourage had the case. So they had to bring in immediate measures. And knowing what it will be like for a developing country where one out of four children goes to bed angry at a time where over 45 percent of food is going waste and with the experience we've had interacting with uh, stakeholders within the food supply chain we thought of launching a food for all ghana covid 19 community emergency intervention program just so that just in case if there was to be a lockdown or a restriction in movement, we will be able to prove to everyone that what we've been talking about in terms of uh, food banking, it becomes important at a time like that. We did launch the project and coincidentally in two days time, we had a government a president addressing the country and then saying that we're going on a lockdown. And during that emotional address to the to Ghanaians, our president had to actually beg food companies within the country at that point in time to start donating food to people within communities that are affected. And I felt for me at that point in time that indeed this is the time for Food for All Africa to prove to people in power the importance of food banking. We started with food that we had in our warehouse. We started providing food boxes with, uh, on a daily basis. We were doing about 100 food boxes in affected communities. We also started uh, hot meal system and where we were doing 600 hot meals per week in the period of the lockdown. Ra rapidly, people saw how we were putting the food boxes and hot meals distribution. And that encouraged a lot of uh, individuals and corporate organizations to step in and say that, look, we admire how Food for All Africa is going about providing this support. And they brought us uh, extra resources to provide food to over. As I speak with you, we've provided food boxes and then hot meals to over 120,000 families. We've been providing uh, uh, food boxes to those who are affected. We've also been providing, and we've had a lot of organizations like development partners coming on board and saying that we like how you coordinating it and providing us the necessary support to reach more people. So this is how important the work we do at Food for All through the COVID season has proven the importance of food banking in Sub-Saharan Africa and in Ghana.
Thank you so much, Elijah. And um, I know what really touched me was someone that was in the streets and you helped and received your food. I think we have a shout out to David. David Hertz is here as well. That's one of the founders of Efetorio Gastromotiva. And that's what keeps on happening to the team there. But people stop and say, you made that difference with that one meal. You don't even realize how that can make a difference. And so it's, it's all integral. It's not just avoiding food waste, but the, the love you can share with a meal that actually is being for, done from the rescued, rescued food. So thank you for sharing. And, um, and shout out to you as well. I shouted out to Cherry before, that's one of the Food Solidarity Fund recipients. And Elijah was around the finalist as well for the Basque Culinary Awards. So, and one of the food heroes um, of FAO, just recently nominated. So thank you for being here and sharing that story. As you are in France, it's not that far we have to travel. We can just go stay in France <laughs> and go to Eva. Eva, I think from chef to chef, um, there's a role of a chef that I'd love to hear a little bit more about, like what kind of chef you, you shared some practical, um, practical solutions already before from your household. Um, but what is the chef's role? And then I would love to hear a little bit, because I know that France is quite, um, Elijah mentioned the government and the lobbying, which is so fundamental in moving policies to advance everyone's work on the local, on the local level. So if you could share a little bit the context of the government support as well that France is giving, because I know that you're pioneering on many of these legislative support systems. So chef's role and support system. <laughs> the floor is yours, Eva. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I think the, the chef's role is, um, of course, to prepare delicious food for everybody, um, to be able to use the ingredients in front of you and, um, we do, like they say in French, regaler somebody. Um, I work with uh, an organization that's uh, called Meet My Mama which is a fantastic organization. And it, I think um, it helps women uh, that come to France um, that might be that want to live their dream of being chefs. Uh, they educate them, they help them launch their businesses. And this is also a lot the government helps with um, to basically live off our talents. And during the lockdown, I was amazed by all these women. Um, the women that lived uh, closest in Paris, um, they came together in the kitchen. Uh, they got people, companies from all around to donate the food that they then cook and they got people to um, ship it everywhere around Paris and to feed the people that really, really needed a hot meal. Like Elijah was just saying, um, it could really change your day, change your life just to get one hot meal like this. And so they did over 12,000 meals during lockdown. Um, we're talking about maybe seven to eight women doing all of this work by themselves absolutely amazing and this organization um, always kind of sticks together and does amazing things and is pushing people to think more about food um, cooking at home being responsible about our environment uh, not only just food waste but also about all the the packaging that we use uh, everything uh, just to kind of help our environment and to be more responsible for ourselves um, in this world that we live in um, the government is launching all kinds of projects um, to help us do this, to help us go further um, and trying to minimize uh, food waste and also just help the environment. They are trying to help farmers. They are encouraging people. Also, there are a lot of chefs that are being encouraged to um, do their own farming. And so a lot of courses being offered and uh, people, the government is really trying to, to help us in that way. Thank you so much. Um, okay, I expected a lot. <laughs> First, I put a shout out, I think, to the group. Um, and Eva, I want to mention before, I, um, sorry, God, I thought there was a chat going on the same time here. Um, Eva, is, as well, meet my mama. You have to find out more about the organization because that podcast just came out. I have not listened yet, but tonight I will make sure to listen to the podcast Meet My Mama because also Meet My Mama is one of the um, Food Solidarity Fund recipients. So congratulations to your work. I really love everything you, you, you ladies <laughs> do. Um, I did a shout out to the chat, but I feel that it didn't come through somehow. But I was asking if there's, um, I can open up for a quick Q&A, otherwise we're gonna go into recommendations for the group. So if you do have a question for our speakers right now, specifically, uh, you can 
put in the chat and I'll make sure to, uh, to include when I speak to each of them. Um, then I wanted to um, ask a little bit, because as we saw, the numbers are quite shocking as well, where um, food waste happens in our own kitchens. And, and Eva touched a little bit upon it, so I'm going to actually start backward this, um, this, <laughs> this time. Eva, if you could elaborate a little bit more about, um, about how we as individuals in our own households, maybe there are some recipes you'd like to share, but like what is your advice for all of us to start acting as well, either in our own, own households or in our own neighborhoods? How can we help? Um, well, I know that here in France, and that, that's what I love, I live in a neighborhood where we have lots of uh, fruit trees and, and people have things in their gardens. Uh, they're not chefs, they, they, they work, uh, you know, daily jobs. So they actually call me and they tell me like, Ava, I got a bunch of apples in my garden. Can you come and do something with them? And I'll be like, sure, sure. I'll bring my buckets and I'll come and, and we'll make jam and we'll distribute build it, you know, between all of us. Um, I think that's a wonderful initiative. That's something you can do with your friends and your neighbors. Um, also, just remember to, when you see something go bad, you know, when you go to the grocery store, first of all, don't be like me. Uh, fight that urge to just put everything in your cart. Never go hungry to the grocery store. That is a rule that I really, <laughs> everybody should really stick to. Um, then mm -hmm. <laughs> only what you need, basically, because when you overbuy of something and you think, oh yeah, no, I'll cook it, I'll make it for sure, that you know, there is there is a big chance that it will go to waste. Um, make bigger meals, make meal planning as well. I do a lot of big meals. If I see that I have like five courgettes and I know that two of them are a little, uh, 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 they're gonna start going off, I will cook everything and I will then put it into my refrigerator and I'll keep it for the next day. Uh, for lunch for the kids or for something else. We can make putnesses are super fun. That's just a fun word to say, put everything in a pot. Um, there's uh, something in Iceland that we do when I was a kid. My mother called it a train wreck. She basically took a bunch of meals. She made a huge sauce and she just popped everything in. We have these little tartlet cups. She put everything in that. There's so many different things, so many fun things that we could do um just at home but i think if you want to think of it in another way and you feel um that you're like yeah but i want to buy this not buying as much does actually save not only the environment but also uh does save money if you just plan before you leave and only buy what you need and limit the um, times that you go to the grocery store it really really does help and remember always to check your covers before you leave <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Elijah, I know your video is off. I hope you're still connected. <laughs> um, Elijah, are you back? Okay, I'll come back to Elijah afterward. I'll go straight to Sherry then. Uh, Sherry, could you share with um, everyone that's here listening in and, and how can we make a difference? Um, how can we contribute either in our own homes or in our neighborhoods? How can we get started? Oh, yeah, because uh, in my company, right, we do not only on the, the food cooking in the rescue kitchen, but actually we also practice zero waste in our production and agriculture. So, so far, my, my company has several farms all over the Philippines. And from day zero when we started, it's all like even the, the, the farm waste are actually converted into organic fertilizer that will plow back to the soil and farmers are actually saving 30% of their cost on their input and also it will, you know, and it's, it's such a big help in their community in terms of savings and it actually increases their, their, their food production. And, and at home, uh, we always have this FIFO. So my company here in the Philippines, my parents are into restaurants. We have like uh, some Filipino restaurants chains in, in the Philippines and Japanese and Thai. And I'm always trained for this FIFO, you know, first in, first out. So it's always like an inventory, even in our homes, in our kitchen, you know, in our ref, that whatever first in, before we go to the grocery to buy another, you know, a set of food, you need to check first. Maybe there's someone in the, something in the corner of the ref is rotting already and we just ignore it or, you know, and 
and um, I really love uh, giving second chances to ugly fruits and vegetables. I think I'll dedicate my life to that because coming from the point that we are also working with farmers and in our farm school, um, we actually, you know, we teach farmers how to do organic and regenerative farming, right? Like the kiss the ground kind of thing. But at the end of the day, we also teach the women, the wives of the farmers, how to do value addition to avoid food waste from the farm itself. So that uh, during rainy season in the Philippines, these farmers have food on their table. And since we have 20 to 21 typhoons every year, you know, and if they couldn't farm, they still have, you know, um, preserved food in their pantry. So even if we're a tropical country, but since we're challenged of the climate and the environmental phenomena, it's something that we really uh, work together. And lastly, I guess the point is, I love, you know, that, you know, Chef Eva and Elijah is here. I'm a farmer and I'm trying to be a chef. But um, since, you know, 2015, I have been collaborating with a lot of chefs in the Philippines. Like last year, we actually brought the best chefs in Asia, in the Philippines, to take over kitchens of big hotels. And, you know, they took over kitchens of big hotels, like Shangri-La Hotel chains and other five-star hotels, to show that these hotels, you know, sometimes there's just too much food waste in the banquet or buffet. And how this... Uh, chefs actually can teach the chefs in these big hotels to just practice zero waste in their operation because they can feed a lot of people. Yeah, so hopefully with this pandemic, you know, all this work with farmers and chefs can actually bring more food waste, um, um, you know, knowledge and awareness, not only on the consumption, but also on the production and connecting it both ways. We can definitely save more. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Sherry. And on that note, when Elijah appeared again. Hi, Elijah. <laughs> I can see you again. Wonderful. So we're on the part where we're giving a little bit of uh, advice for how each of us um, can actually do something against food waste. And what's your recommendation for, for us to either get started in our communities or just start within our own kitchen? So if you have any practical tips for everyone here, that would be amazing. Yes. Uh, so uh, for us to work around food waste, food loss and food waste. I believe so much that uh, it has to start with children. Uh, the education on food loss and food waste cannot be complete without getting it to the younger ones. They understand and can grow. You know, for us as adults, uh, it has become a lifestyle. It has become uh, a mentality that uh, once I can afford to buy the food, uh, at the end of the day, it is my money that I used in purchasing that food. So no one can tell me not to waste it. Meanwhile, we forget that when you waste food, it's not just the food you've wasted. You've contributed to greenhouse emission. You've uh, wasted the energy, the resources that went into that production of that food. So the education on food waste needs to start from our children who are the future leaders. They are the future leaders. Uh, they need, with, with, with climate change, with climate change, with the challenges that our world faces today, it is our children that will suffer more. And so in the battle against food waste and food loss, we need to start from the schools. And for us at Food for All Africa, this is quite critical to us because we believe that if there can be a change around it, it has to start with children. And that's what we keep saying. And for this year, for instance, I've monitored due to the COVID, we have monitored at Food for All Africa, we've monitored how the, the first ever celebration on food loss and food waste have involved children. And even so now, most of these children are at home. They are at home. I keep getting feedbacks from parents that we work with that uh, when these kids are home because of the COVID, they are eating more. And I ask, okay, you say they are eating more. Does it mean they are wasting more? 
And most parents will go like, yes, once they eat, they will waste. And I go like, yeah, that's where you need to educate them. That is where you need to let them understand that uh, wasting food is not just the food they are wasting. These are the other things they are, and how it contributes to the climate change that we are facing today. And when we do so, we will be able at least to contribute to a more greener environment and then our future, which is our children, can equally be at the forefront of responsible food consumption and production in the near future. Elijah, thank you so much for, for leaving that last inspiring note that it's the next generation that we need to prepare, like the next generation of change makers. So on that note, I, I wish I could continue for a long time, but the good news is that we have a lot of interesting and amazing, inspiring content coming up during the um, Food Solidarity Gathering of, um, of Social Gastronomy, which is soon happening from the 16th until the 23rd, and it's almost all community-led sessions. We made a big call to action because the knowledge is those that are at the forefront, and we're here to raise these voices. So I encourage everyone, um, the program is coming out soon and it's really exciting and I'm already signed up for everything. <laughs> so whoever got inspired or motivated to learn more, to contribute, um, there is the gathering coming up. And for those that are not yet part of um, social gastronomy movement, become part if you have a social gastronomy organization, just like our beautiful free speakers today, uh, you can sign up to the map on, map on the members um, page of social gastronomy movement and uh, maybe you're the next one to host the session. So on that note, Paola, I'm not going to forget, if everyone could turn on the camera that is willing to, and it's okay, pyjamas are okay, I'm promising you, uh, we, can take a, <laughs> we can take a quick photo together just to capture this beautiful moment uh, that can get um, posted together with a recording of this session. So on that note, thank you so much, everyone, who contributed. Thank you for everyone being here. And I guess now smile. <laughs> I guess someone from the team is taking it. <laughs> slowly, slowly. And it's also amazing that we are from so many different parts of the world. I just want to say thank you, like, from all over. So it's beautiful that we can capture that moment if we are all here together. Brilliant. Thank you so, everyone. And your kids clapping. So see, Elijah, the next generation is very excited about all of this. So keep doing, keep inspiring. And I hope to see everyone uh, latest during the Food Solidarity Gathering online. Thank you.